Well, hello everyone. Are we all ready? Awesome. So I've already had a little bit of my bio there, but you can have it again for briefness. And um, yeah, so we have a slight issue with privacy. Now you're all here, so you're, obvious, you're really concerned with privacy. But we've got a massive problem because the outside world isn't that concerned with privacy. Now I want you just to, to concentrate on this frog for a moment because I feel this is a very good metaphor for how the general public is out there at the moment. Because we've been gaslit into thinking that everything that's put on the internet is public. Whatever you do, it will always be there forever. And so people have got used to that concept and it means that governments ask you for more and more information to give them information on forms and you give that information without a thought. When we checked into our Airbnb, we had to fill in a form for local police, but then the landlady also had additional forms just to, ha to show that we accepted the, the rules of the household. But in a way, you could argue that she's a data collector now because it's not just for law enforcement. So concentrate on the floor of ROG while I say a couple of statements. So do we actually need privacy? We've all had the arguments with our family. They're on Facebook. They upload pictures of their children. Your friends do as well. And teenagers, well, since the days of MySpace, teenagers have been uploading their private stuff online, talking about things that they wouldn't talk to their parents about. So it's dead. Forget it. Toss it out the window. We're up there forever. And with terrorism and criminals out there looking to, s to steal your money, we've got to give up a little bit of our privacy so the police can tell the difference between the bad people and the rest of us. How's that water feeling? So, how do we get people to actually care about privacy and to push back slightly when officialdom and businesses ask us for information that they perhaps shouldn't be? Well, in the past, humanity has had to go and learn about how to cooperate, why you have to um, accept that society works a certain way. And the way that society did that was with stories. Back in ancient Greece, you had Aesop's fables, which taught you various bits of human behaviour to not aim too high with hubris or not to covet what you don't need, things like that. And with stories, that leads us on nicely to this guy. This guy was called Ovid. And he was a poet during about 2,000 years ago, during the time of Augustus. The Roman Republic had gone through several civil wars. Augustus had won finally. And who'd went to the Republic into thinking that they were still a Republic? Because he called himself the first citizen. Not a dictator, unlike his predecessor, Julius Caesar. So, Ovid wrote poetry, mainly about the gods and about religion. He also wrote a few other things. Now, Ovid eventually got exiled to the Black Sea because he fell foul of Augustus's regime. Augustus's regime at the time was trying to change Roman society to focus more on the family unit, to be respectable. So Ovid wrote about gods and goddesses and about how they interfered with each other and also the l people and less powerful characters. And he, he also wrote a couple of um, love poems one in particular called the Ars Armata, which pickup artists love because it details out how to pick up women and then how to get rid of them when you're done. And so that when he got exiled, no one's quite sure why, 
there were rumours of him having an affair with Augustus' granddaughter, and the Ars Aromata got chucked in for good measure. So at the end of his life, he focused on two works, which was the Metamorphosis and Fasti. Fasti covers religious festivals. Towards the end of his life, he was still trying to curry favour with Augustus by mentioning the imperial family. And the reason for that was Augustus was well on his way to becoming a god. Augustus's uncle, Julius Caesar, already had been deified. So in Ro Roman society, religion and politics were incredibly closely interlinked. So Ovid was writing politically. So his other major work was Metamorphosis, which was about, he repackaged the Greek myths and formed them into a long epic poem about how the gods happened, about transformation. So this takes us on to a particular tale, Io and Argus. Now, some of you will already be aware with Argus where I'm going, but I'll just do a brief summary for you. So, Io was a beautiful, lovely nymph, and Zeus, as Zeus does, decided to go and do a bit of a Me Too moment and harass Io. She said no, he didn't take no for an answer, and to cover it up, covered the entire land in a cloud. Zeus's wife Hera was a bit suspicious and went down to go and investigate. And what she saw was Zeus with a cow. And she went, oh, that's a lovely cow, can I have it? And he's like, uh, yes, yes, I'll have the cow. Yeah, it's lovely. And then sloped off thinking he'd got away with it. Hera in the meantime went, right, gonna put that cow under surveillance. And she happened to have a very useful tool of surveillance, who, who was a giant called Argus. And his long name is Argus Panoptes because he had about a hundred eyes dotted all around his body and he could keep them constantly awake. He only needed two of them to be closed to rest and have some sleep. So Io managed to get, start getting the word out to her father who was a river god and eventually pressure was put on Zeus to feel a little bit bad. What Zeus then did was get Hermes to go and do an exploit on Argus. And the exploit was a story that sent Argus to sleep. Hermes then permanently disabled the surveillance by killing Argus. And Io got away, was pursued by a gadfly by Hera, who was a bit upset that Io got away. You know, so many parallels with whistleblowers and women who, and men who actually dare to detail what they've gone through. And then Ovid decided to go and update the story by adding peacocks. Hera felt a little bit sad about her tool of surveillance being murdered. So she decided to memorialize him forever by sticking all of his eyes on a peacock. And it's a funny thing though, but what does this have to do with nowadays? Well, I saw some of the guys were smirking in the audience. If you've read a little bit of the classics and you start a business and you want to show that you're, you're a security minded firm or you provide video surveillance, you call yourself Argus Videos or Argus Security. You stick a big eye right in the middle of your logo and that's it. People know exactly what you're about. Our popul popular culture references it explicitly with things like um, Neil Gaiman's American Gods and with um, the Big Brother reality series. And the thing is, that idea of the reality series about constant observation comes from an idea in the 17th century by a man called Jeremy Bentham, who was an English philosopher. And he created the panopticon. And what that is, is a circular area with a series of cells. You have one observer in a central tower. And in the original design, if a specific cell wanted to be observed, you'd shine a light on it. And the philosophical idea was you knew you were being constantly observed. You didn't know if someone was consciously observing you. 
but the idea was you could be observed at any time so you had to be good in the case if you were a factory worker because it wasn't just for pr prisons you kept on at your work Bentham actually got the idea from his brother he'd gone and done it with a kind of circular office with workers so I suspect he might have invented the open plan bastard <laughs> But there's a little bit of a problem when we think about Argus. We've forgotten all about the person actually being surveilled. We've forgotten about Ayo. We've lost empathy for the legend. So, is it even appropriate for us to say, consider using peacocks as a symbol to try and curb surveillance? Well, in Buddhism, it the peacock's a, a symbol of cleansing. Same in Hinduism, the gods ride on peacocks and peacocks are almost like a sin eater, so you're not like, meant to eat them. Which is funny, because the Romans loved eating peacocks. So let's try another tale, which also references the Panopticon. Let's look at 1984 by George Orwell. It's not a happy book, and it, and it was never going to be a happy book because Orwell was commenting on Stalinism and what was starting to happen in East Germany with the Stasi. And again, the book explicitly references the philosophical idea of the Panopticon, the idea that you could be observed at any time. Um, this stifles thought. You end up conforming to what society expects you to be like because it's pointless changing anything, because you're always being observed and what you do will can and will be used against you. But again, with that surveillance, with things like Newspeak, we always focus on the mechanisms of oppression. We're not really focusing on Winston, who's the person that's, that's hopeless because he's constantly being observed and he knows he is. And we have to think about how we, how we change that thought, how we stop getting so excited about the tech and think more about the people. So, but keeping that in mind, other people thought about the idea of 1984 and wanted to explicitly reference it. Um, the head of the Internet Architecture Board and the head of the IETF decided they needed to write a statement back in August two, 1996 because they were incredibly worried about the direction that the internet was going in terms of governments trying to, to stop encryption being exported out of the US. But I'll just move to the side for a second, just place that in your minds. RFCs are standards for the internet. They can either be a statement, they can cover experimental things for how a protocol could work. They can cover best practice for how you should set up servers to talk to each other. And sometimes they can be succeeded. They're standards. Ideally, we should follow them whenever possible because that makes the internet run better and it makes it a lot easier for us to support it. Anybody can, in fact, submit an RFC. There's even April Fool's ones. But does everybody use it? Some people do, some people don't. Some techs resent the very idea of having to follow RFCs. So they're not enforceable, but it's nice if you use them. So back to this. So as I said, it was published in 1996. The US had an active embargo on escrow software. In 2015, the IETF had a discussion and decided to make it best, pra best current practice. And the discussion summarised felt that people had been using it as best current practice for years, so they might as well just make it official. And they felt that the RFC number in particular was a good symbol of what they had to try and find a balance between secur security for governments and security for internet users. So 
the internet steering group is just part of the IETF, it's the, the heads of each area. So they were concerned about the need for increased protection of international commercial transactions on the internet. So at the time, trade embargo, you couldn't export software. Anecdotally, there's a tale of a company in the US having to strip out the encryption part of the software, ship it to a company in, in Europe, and then tell that company how to code back in the encryption. Mm -hmm. Governments at that time were also putting immense pressure on companies to use weak encryption keys so that they could easily break communications. Um, this was before 2001, but they were already aware of organisations like Al-Qaeda. Mm. And in addition to that, they said, well, if you can't weaken the encryption keys, can, can we just have a copy? Can we just use it and just plug in whenever we promise we won't just go into it willy-nilly? Although some regimes prohibited it entirely. Or perhaps you might get it for your banking, but mainly it'd be for that government's communications. And I think if you've been paying attention to the news, nothing much has changed. This RFC is more important than ever. So what's threatening it now? Well, if you're paying attention to the use, you know that Facebook is being put under pressure by the UK, US and Australian governments to not extend end-to-end -end encryption to its other applications. Of course, with it being a US company, the governments can possibly get their um, information another way from sen Facebook central servers. But we'll put that aside for a minute. And of course, you've got Google as well. It's had about 15 odd years of email and how you use their search services in addition to, to other advertising networks and social networks that collect your data. We've been gaslit into thinking that in order for us to have all the perks, we need to, to give up bits of our privacy. And then, of course, there's facial recognition rapidly being rolled out across CCTV networks, as well as um, DNA services where people who are curious about their genetics just go and upload their um, data up there. Because they don't think of it as data, they just think of it as a DNA test. And believe me, it's really frustrating when a member of your family uploads that to Ancestry.com's DNA. So... Now, some people might be sceptical about that, so I'll give you a few examples. So, there was a bit of a fuss back in 2015, and David Cameron, the Prime Minister at the time, before the mess of Brexit, actually stated in Parliament that he didn't really want encryption for communications. So, he didn't care about any of any British citizens having any sort of privacy in the private communications at all. And to that end, um, the UK government created this bill, which forces large internet providers who provide your broadband to store and record logs about when you connect to the internet, what browser connections you make, what your IP was at the time. You get the idea, it's invasive. And then GCHQ decided to go and speak to privacy advocates, <laughs> saying, we, we'd really like to work out what's an acceptable level of invasion of your, your personal data that we can do. And privacy advocates are like, no. And they're like, oh, please, we promise we won't use this inappropriately. Whereas the Snowden revelations revealed that actually GCHQ overstep um, their remit all of the time. And of course, once that data is collected by any organisation in the public service, it could be sold on. Um, and the thing is, they claim that that data is anonymised. But if you've got a really rare condition, it doesn't take much to actually de-anonymise that data when you compare it to other databases. And then earlier on this year, 
um, there was a kerfuffle in the press because the EU announced that it had been investigating UK officials who'd copied the, the Schengen Information Database. Not the entirety of Interpol, just the part of it that covers when you go in and out of the Schengen zone. And when we say officials, we actually mean they're third party contractors who work for places like IBM, who took copies of that data onto their laptops. And it's a pretty good um, supposition to, to think that that got uploaded up to the US government servers as well, which is in breach of e privacy and other things. So, and then of course, there's deliberate data deletion as well, which is disturbingly 1984. Theresa May, before she became Prime Minister, was Home Office Minister, and she explicitly took the decision to delete the landing cards of the Windrush boat, which, was, which had carried over many um, immigrants from the Caribbean and so on to come and work in the UK, to come and help rebuild the UK after the war. And this has meant that several individuals have been deported back to, Jama to Jamaica and elsewhere when they've only known their life in the UK. And there's an entire Wikipedia page for every level of local government up to the top where officials have just lost the data, <laughs> ranging from them leaving their laptops somewhere <coughs> randomly to a thumb drive being handed into the local office. So you can't really trust governments to be that careful with the data. America is just a dumpster fire, really. Um, <laughs> I say 2019 here, but it's been going on for some time since at least the Boston bomber, where where um, law enforcement were trying to get Apple to, to give them keys to crack an iPhone. And all of that data is being used by Palantir to analyse it, to build up a semantic map of you and your friends. And that's being used to... I've used the exact wording from the press there. I don't agree with the term illegal immigrants. Um... It's just nasty. And of course, the NSA have had access to American citizens' own, pri own private call logs for years. Obama gave it, and it's about to be renewed again. And then the Republican National Convention, who want to re-elect Trump, gave access to an elector database, which covered nearly 200 million American citizens' data which includes demographic data. And that got left up on a cloud server for anyone to get. It got taken down soon after, but... I think Australia. <laughs> they're kind of... I think they're on the same level as America. They don't particularly like immigrants either. But Turnbull, very much like David Cameron, doesn't like encryption, it stops him doing what he wants to do. And the c I don't think anything's going to change for the current Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, either. They also did a similar act as the UK did, although this was amended because the original Telecommunications Act was enabled in 1979. They've just updated it for the technology. Um, although, to be fair... Um, Organisations like GCHQ and the NHC, N NSA have always had the ability to listen in on calls with primitive technology like crocodile clips. And what they'd like nowadays is to have a virtual equivalent of that. And the thing is, with this data all being co collected, um, Australian Federal Police illegally, illegally did 116 searches in 2016 of collected metadata in order to investigate journalists who were trying to help um, immigrants who are being held offshore, or offshore from Australia on one of the islands off there. It's a human rights crisis. 
And then German researchers found that the Australian Medical Service had been uploading patient files for onto cloud servers. So this includes things like x-rays and tests for analysis. And then, of course, you've got your tap on and tap off data. That got leaked as well. So we definitely have an issue with biometric data as well, because just this month in France, they're rolling out a facial recognition service. And pretty soon, the only way for a French citizen to have a legal digital ID from the LSM system is to use it. And privacy advocates in, the, in France are going mental because it's not a good idea. But we'll go into the DNA now. So people might say that using a DNA service to test isn't that dangerous. Buzzfeed in April 2019 actually were curious about how easy would it be to find people so they got 10 journalists around the BuzzFeed network to do some DNA tests and submit it to an organisation called GEDmatch. GED, GEDmatch came, came up in the news because in 2018, a serial killer in the US got um, arrested because his relative came up on this database. GEDmatch explicitly give access to that genetic database to law enforcement because they believe it's a good thing to help solve crimes like that. So the journalist decided to go and conduct a search to see if he could find the identities of the BuzzFeed journalists. He got about six out of the ten with varying degrees of difficulty because he also was able to use publicly available information. In some cases, a relative had also uploaded to the service. In other cases, they found it, find them directly. One case, it was through an aunt who was on Facebook. So, yeah, commercial DNA testing still needs a warrant at the moment. So if you're using 23andMe and Ancestry DNA, you're all right in theory. So no, it's not that much of a danger, but like anonymized medical data as part of a data set, it's not that hard to join the dots. There's that frog again. What are feeling toasty? <laughs> so, do we need privacy? Is it pointless? I mean, your family, they're communicating constantly on Facebook. Um, yep, it's still a risk to your privacy, even if you don't have a Facebook account, it will follow you around. And more to the point, some of your friends will uh, upload pictures from years ago. You go, yeah, that's my friend there. And teenagers don't care. That's not true. Teenagers do care about privacy. They're used to being constantly surveilled by their parents. So they use the system. They perform stenography. They code messages out in the open, but they use references that only each other only their friends will understand. The messages are hidden in plain sight. So their concern about privacy is at a lower level. So perhaps a bit more awareness and education will change their minds. Because let's face it, we don't want a digital world where the next Greta Thunberg is under surveillance from cradle to grave. So yeah, they're proud of it. We need to give up a little bit of privacy for our security to stop terrorism. That's Dwight Eisenhower. He was a general during the Second World War and he was also a president in the 1950s. And he's quite clear in it. He says that if you want total security, go to prison. There you're fed, you're clothed, you're given medical care and so on. Okay, maybe not in the US. The only thing lacking is freedom. And I mean, what defines our security really? Because I don't want a world where we're under this, all around us from CCTV, from what we choose to put online. We're in a virtual panopticon just now. 
we're aware we're in it, but the rest of the world aren't. So what can we do? You know, don't just take my word for this. Do your own research and then find yourself getting progressively angrier and feeling just that little bit overwhelmed by it all. If you're a programmer, try and build an encryption from the beginning. Don't leave it up as an instruction for users to enable encryption. Because often when they're trying to get a demo up, they'll just forget about it. They won't put it in. HTTPS, not HTTP. And definitely follow privacy-focused organisations online. Look at people like Privacy International. They've got some really interesting articles. Um, also consider organisations that care about privacy and decentralisation. Organisations like Frama and their Chatons network. But obviously, like on aeroplanes, you've got to protect yourself first before you can protect anyone else. You know, you've got to think about, am I wearing something stupidly that can be used, that can be tracked? So yeah. And definitely consider going on Macedon and Diaspora. Build your own network so you can encourage your friends and family to join. Because one of the difficulties with using these networks is there's a great community on there, but it's not quite the community that your family would understand or get. So it's, uh, it's on us to start building that to make a welcoming space for them. And definitely try and find ways that we can explain to our friends and family. Use family history. Use local stories about heroes, if you can, where something, a similar metaphor can be used. You know, you want to focus on the cow. You want to focus on Ayo being surveilled. You don't want to focus on that. You want to fall out of love with that aspect of technology and fall back in love with community. One of the um, strengths of Ubuntu was it changed how communities interacted. Before it used to be RTFM with things like Fedora. And Ubuntu opened up Linux by going, we can write guides, we can help you come on the forums. And that's what we need to do for privacy as well. That's just what I said. <laughs> but yeah, maybe we can use the peacock again. Maybe we can use each eye to represent a part of surveillance that we shut down. Because this isn't a dystopian future. It's happening right now out in Myanmar, out in with the Uyghurs in China. Our data is actually actively being used against us and our friends and family in our elections. When you look at Brexit, when you look at Trump, when you look at the election that happened with Trinidad and Tobago where they encouraged the young people not to vote through social media, it's being used against us and it's a real danger to democracy. We can't normalise being surveilled and thinking it's pointless because we're being surveilled. And I'm not precious about this. Use it. If you have, you find something in the press where you feel it normalises the idea of surveillance and mass surveillance, use that hashtag. Thank you. Any questions? you have any specific thoughts about um, DNS over HTTPS? That's an interesting question, actually. Um, there are organizations in the UK actively campaigning against it for, for all the usual reasons. They're worried about the danger to children online. Won't someone please think about the children? But what that can also mean is that children effectively have even less privacy. And the mo what that um, investigatory bill in the UK also did, though, was do a metadata was do a metadata filter, where sites are actually filtered in the UK, and they're about to build bring in age verification for websites as well. 
which is a privacy nightmare. So I think it is a good idea. I don't think it should be the end of the conversation because ideally I don't want us to be relying on something like DNS, which is a centralized service to enable security. Yeah, I think I think also the, the biggest point and also one of the problems that I have, well, it is being implemented right now, if you look at the Mozilla case, is that they are putting, by default, they are sending all of their DNS traffic to our friends in the US, uh, to Cloudflare. Uh, so I don't think that is the, I mean, from one point, I understand people that want to have their DNS secured and they're at the hotel or they're even here and they need the UH, the UH or whatever. Uh, but at the other point, uh, we are also forcing and pushing uh, the users to use the centralized DNS from Cloudflare, which I believe it's a really bad idea. Um, so even though from one side, DOH is of course good, you also, you also have of course privacy in mind, but it's also the way that we push it to the users because if you have an icon that shows up, hey, do you want to use DOH or not? And people might click yes, might click no, and no one knows what's going in the background, or at least most of people don't know what's going on in the background. So um, I think that 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 it's also maybe a discussion. Uh, maybe it's a bit uh, out of what you were talking, but also at the same time, yeah. uh, of what you're saying, uh, it's also like we need also to provide the correct solutions and in some way decentralized how DNS is also being uh, passed to to the people, to our friends and family. Yeah, I think I think so as well. Um. I mean, when you think about it, though, that central DNS is, is that panopticon as well. Yeah. And I don't know how many people are Opera browser users, but I don't use it because the mobile browser goes back to the, the offices in Norway. And I'm sure the Opera folk are lovely, but I don't particularly want to trust my proxy. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. But um, we need a decentralized internet. I think it is the best way to ensure privacy and more to the point to have control over what you're browsing on. Because all of these centralized services take away more of your control, your ability to tune what you see on the internet. Yeah, that's it, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for, for your presentation. Uh, you you just said now uh, one good step we can do um, to somehow fix this, which is a technical way. Uh, a technical way. So it's let's work on decentralized internet. I was wondering if you had any um, human aspect or a human step you would recommend people to do. You gave some ideas on your presentation, but one simple thing you can say to privacy, non-technical, but privacy-oriented people to, so they know one way they can actually do in order, or something they can do in order to start fighting against this. Well, I mean, I think definitely a step is to, to go and speak to human look at human rights organizations and privacy focused organizations because they've been wrestling with this problem for years privacy i think it's privacy international published a, a very interesting long, long article about what data brokerage could look like in the future and it, it spoke about various data models in simplicity um, but i mean We've got the technical answers. We actually have some of the, the ways to advocate for privacy, but we're not going to get anywhere with that until we can find a way to empathise with people. Because you see the same with, um, well, with the polarisation with things like, like Brexit. Sorry. Um, you've got people who are on Remain and people who want to, to leave the EU. And um, I'm a hard Remainer. I'd like more. I want my federation. Um, but I understand that I've got some friends who voted for Brexit and I know I have to try and open the conversation to them to say, this is where we're at, how do we work together? And you've got to do that when you're explaining privacy to your parents. I mean, how many people in the room have managed to get members of their family using Ubuntu? Well, exactly, it, I think it's a similar method. You get your, your family to use it because it's simple, because it's easy, so that it becomes easier to use that 
than not use it. You had to use some empathy in order to help your family understand it and get to grips with it. And I don't think there's any difference. I think these represents it. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>